Welcome on to the next of our 2019 MediaHelp Trupnet online webinars. We're going to be chatting all things Trupnet. It's coming up at the end of this month. Uh, as they say, spring has sprung. And uh, it's all coming up at the end of the month. It's good to have you with us. Before we get into what we're going to be chatting about tonight, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Uh, if you can, give us a like and just let us know in the comments where you're joining us from this evening. Uh, and also that you can see the MediHelp Trucknet logo on the screen as well. If you wouldn't mind putting that in the comments, it would be massively, massively appreciated. Uh, yeah, let us know and uh, I see we are getting a couple of thumbs up. So, yep, yeah, that seems to be working, which is, uh, which is good. And then I just want to make sure that I can see the chat on my side. Uh, let me try and do that. Alrighty, there we go. It looks like everything seems to be working the way it should be. Lots of thumbs up, which is great. All right, let's get straight into it tonight and some of the things we are going to be talking about. A big introduction. Uh, just, yeah, firstly, a welcome on behalf of all of us. Uh, who are we, you may be asking. My name is Brad Brown. I'm going to be facilitating uh, this this evening. I'm the slow one in that picture. Uh, I've got a background uh, coming from radio and I co-own a website called Coach Parry. We do swim, cycling, and uh, oh, I swim, uh, bike, and run a little bit. And I'm just here to host this evening. The two people you are here uh, to hear from is our cycling coach, Devlin Eden, who's a senior sports scientist at uh, Semley at the University of Pretoria. He's also a Cycling Australia Level 2 coach, and he's also the resident cycling coach, as I said, at coachperry.com. We've got Dev on the line. Devlin, how's it? Nice to touch base. Brad. Yeah, good to be back again. Looking forward to another informative chat. Yeah, absolutely. And then also on the call with us tonight, we've got Nikki Villiers, who is a dietitian. She graduated at the University of Pretoria. She's got a postgraduate diploma through the International Olympic Committee and a master's degree in dietetics. Uh, she's also a part-time lecturer at the University of Pretoria. She's in private practice in Pretoria, and she's also our resident dietitian and sports nutritionist uh, over at Coach Perry. Nikki, how's it? All good, thanks. Looking forward to chatting to everybody. Um, everything going well this side. Excellent. Yeah, it's going to be a good night tonight. Uh, just what are we going to go through tonight? Although, just before I do that, a little bit of background uh, about Coach Perry as a business. We're the official coaching partner uh, of the MediHealth Trupnet. We offer cycling, running, and triathlon coaching, and the website to get to is coachperry.com. All right, what are we going to cover tonight? We're going to be talking about where you should be in your training right now. We're going to look at what you should be focusing on over the next few weeks. And then talking nutrition and a big focus on nutrition tonight in the build up to race day and also talking about what to do on race day. And then I'll be sharing a list of resources that you can use in the build up uh, to race day at the end of the month. As always, questions are welcome. Uh, we love getting your questions. So, yeah, if you do, that, you're more than welcome to pop them into the chat below or into the comments below. Uh, and we'll get to those in a moment as well. So. Uh, what you can do is get those questions in. We've got Shirley, who's in uh, Gaborone in Botswana. How's it, Shirley? Nice to, nice to have you with us as well. Uh, Almarie is with us too. So is Rob, who's in Durban. How's it, Rob? Nice to have you on as well. And then, yeah, let's just touch quickly on... Uh, oh, before I forget, you want to stick around for the end as well, because I'm going to share a chance for you to win. There is an incredible prize up for grabs, uh, which I'll tell you about a little bit later on. Uh, on tonight's uh, webinar as well. Just to get uh, a little bit of background about the race, if you missed our last webinar, which happened uh, four weeks ago, uh, we went through this in a lot more detail. So if you want to find out uh, all the ins and outs about the race, make sure you check that link out. Uh, but it is going to be an amazing, amazing day. It's a whole weekend of festivities taking place at Supersport Park in Centurion. And there's a cycling market and registration, which happens on the Friday and the Saturday, 27th, 28th of September. Uh, and then there's the Junior Trump Net for all the youngins on the 28th, which is the Saturday. Uh, and then the big one, the Mini Help Trump Net, 95Ks through the greater city of Twine District, full road closure, which is great. Uh, and uh, great news is it's a seeding event for the Cape Town Cycle Tour. And it is the final uh, seeding event for the Ride Joburg, which is happening uh, in November. So it's a great chance for you to uh, improve your seeding uh, for that one. Dev, let's get straight into the, the, the riding side of things. 
Uh, let's talk about four weeks out. What should we be focusing on at the moment? Look, uh, up until now, so we had obviously discussed in the last one the the lead up to now and obviously leading up into uh, your main sort of training block at the moment. Uh, really irrelative of what level rider you're at, and we'll go into a little bit of detail about that now. Uh, but I think the big thing still... Being four weeks out is still to try and maintain as much consistency as possible, and that's a, a word that I'm going to kind of drive home quite a bit tonight, uh, is trying to keep the consistency in your training no matter what. Make sure you're getting familiar and getting some group rides in. So the group rides, again, as we've mentioned before, just helps with maintaining the skill and keeping you sharp with riding with others, knowing what's happening around you. Um, and also which Nikki's going to chat about, but your nutrition strategy, getting comfortable with what you should be taking in as well as the actual physical task of eating or drinking on the bike. So getting comfortable to maybe reaching for a bar in your back pocket or down for your bottle on the bike. So it's more about just making sure for those, and I think these points are probably a little bit more towards the beginners and the first time riders, but something that is necessary and something for us to, to keep focusing on we think there might be silly things but they are vital yeah and it's uh, particularly getting comfortable sort of with and i say nutrition strategy but it's exactly what you said Dev, that one of the the biggest things from a safety perspective particularly in mass participation events is reaching down for bottles or taking something out as you say out of the, the back of your cycling jersey uh, and the only way you actually get used to doing that is by practicing it on group rides in training yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I know we've had a couple of questions in the past of people who are completely beginners uh, starting out and have to stop every time they want to reach for a bottle on their bike. So it's those sort of things that are little skills that you can be learning in your backyard while you're riding on the lawn, for instance, or around your block, and then slowly start to incorporate that as you're getting those group rides in. And being four weeks out from race day now, we don't really have a lot of time to get that done. So now is definitely the time that you should be doing it and making sure that you're comfortable with that 100%. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's talk about, we, we've broken things down into two major groups. Obviously, the finishes to sub five hours, those are the, the, the I say beginners and slightly slower finishes. What should they be focusing on training-wise over the next four weeks, Dev? So the focus here still needs to be time in the saddle. Um, I definitely don't think we need to be worrying too much about uh, a lot of interval training and that sort of thing. So for, for this group of riders, time in the saddle and making sure that you, again, consistently riding uh, with and comfortable with the longer distance rides. So, so those are vital. So I'm hoping by now you have had some level of long rides in and we're still continuing to build that. Uh, and then I think being the peak block now for the next couple of weeks is to make sure that there's a little bit of intensity in those sessions. So not always easy rides. Um, if you are on some long rides, maybe plan routes that have got some rolling hills to them. Um, some undulating courses might just help a little bit from a, a strength point of view. Uh, and then maybe once a week looking at just throwing in maybe an interval session or something of a little bit of high intensity that is also going to help you come race day when you do start to get a little bit overexcited, uh, climbing up the hills, that sort of thing that, that helps you. Um, also, again, a very big point is to remember your focus on recovery strategies. Uh, and by recovering well, allows you to be consistent, allows you to be injury-free, allows you to, well, hopefully be injury-free, uh, curb illness and that sort of thing as well. And make sure that the next day you're well recovered to be able to go again and make sure that you're hitting all those training sessions required. We have one of the risks at this point in, in training as well, particularly if you think of the time of the year when this race is, uh, coming out of winter, there's probably a, a fairly good probability that training hasn't gone quite according to plan. And often we get to a race or four weeks out from a race and you think, you know what, we're going to try and smash as much as we can in a shorter period of time, kind of like how I went to Varsity, cramming, training. Uh, is that a good idea? Is it a bad idea? No. So, again, depending on the, the level of rider you are, but if you're sort of going to be in the back half of the field and your, your goal is to just finish or maybe just to crack a sub five hour, you're actually going to end up doing more harm than good. So... That is, a, it's, it's a very big risk. A lot of people feel, well, we are under pressure. We're going to try and cram as much high-intensity training in as possible. The problem there 
is then we neglect that recovery side of things. Um, and all you're going to be doing there is come race day, you're actually probably going to be quite fatigued. Uh, you are at more risk of getting ill. So, no, you're, you're going to do more harm than good. You'd actually be better off just doing long, steady rides uh, and making sure that you're recovering well in between so that you can consistently be doing that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's talk about the, the faster end of the field, the, the sub sort of 4.30s down to, to the sub 3 hours. Yeah, so again, peak block, we, we now got pretty much two weeks. For these, uh, these category riders, we probably actually could push that to about three weeks to go from decent quality training before we start worrying about tapering. Uh, your peak block now, there needs to be focus on the quality and by quality and intensity in the sessions, I'm, I'm not referring to let's do more of it, but there must be a purpose to what you're doing. So if you are doing quality or intensity type sessions, so interval type training, there needs to be a combination that's happening some threshold type work. So I'm talking longer intervals, um, 5, 10, 15 minute type intervals, as well as doing some shorter stuff that's going to help with power and going to help with a lot of speed and that over or the power will translate into speed on race day as well. So there needs to be a balance, but make sure you understand what you're doing those intervals for. So I, I do see from time to time people do interval training or they might go and do a spin class, but they're not 100% sure what they're trying to achieve in that session. And just going to do a high intensity session might actually be countering what you're trying to achieve. So that's what I mean by just have a purpose and understand what you're trying to achieve in that high intensity session. Uh, in saying that and focusing on the intensity, it is vital that you still do not neglect doing the steady state or the easy type riding. So this is where, and we've, we've mentioned in other forums before, but doing sort of a balance of an 80% of your weekly training volume being low intensity zone one, zone two kind of work. Uh, and then the, the 20% of your weekly volume being zone four, zone five, the high intensity work. So no matter what, as much as you think now's the time to be doing speed and all that, you still need to, don't neglect the long, easy rides, your LSD, long, slow distance, those type of rides are vital. And then again, my focus on recovery strategies and making sure that you're consistently training is what's going to get you there on race day. Yeah, Dev, and, and these guys in this group, they're, they're probably training a bit more because they've got a bit more ability. And, and it goes back to the, the question that I asked at the end of the other one about the cramming. And I'm glad you, you brought in the, the sort of don't neglect the easy stuff because the risk here where you do have some level of fitness is to think, oh, you know what, we're going to smash every single session as hard as we can for the next three weeks and we'll be good to, good to go on race day. And that's not necessarily the most ideal way to, to approach this thing. Yeah, for sure. And... and for anyone who is thinking along those lines, the the risk is that you've probably been doing that for a while now already. And by doing that, your endurance base starts to take a knock. So you might be getting strong and you might be able to smash a hill very quickly. Um, but the problem is how quickly are you re going to recover after doing a high intensity bout? So you can imagine now doing a 90 or 95k ride and you push it and you're doing the hills and you're smashing them. But Come later in that ride is when you're going to hit that wall and you're going to struggle. We, we need to prolong and, and enhance how long you can go for. Um, and that recovery within bouts and making sure that you can keep a steady state for a lot longer is vital. And this is where that aerobic base or the, the, the easier stuff counts. Absolutely. We went into that in, in quite a bit of detail in the, the first webinar we did. Uh, if you want to check out the link for that, you can actually find it. It's the pinned post on this Facebook page. You can uh, watch that when we're done here tonight. If you've got any questions, uh, feel free to pop them into the comments and we'll take a couple of questions throughout and uh, we'll answer them as we go. But uh, yeah, if there are any, you're more than welcome to pop them into the comments. I'm going to bring Nikki in now just to chat a little bit of uh, nutrition uh, and basically what we should be focusing on in the build-up to this year's MediHelp Trupnet. Nikki, nutrition is vital. I mean, we, we talk about training and training hard, but why is, why is nutrition so important? Hey, yes. Um, sitting listening to you guys and um, talking about recovery and everything else, I think the main thing now in terms of nutrition is obviously support the training that's going in. So if we eat well, we can train well. 
not eating well, the training is going to fall to some other time. So that's one of your main advantages. So we eat for performance. And the other big one that's mentioned by Dev is um, the recovery part of it. It's quite important. And then I think the main thing, Brad, is we, we sometimes do things, um, as you chatted just now, that's to the detriment of health. And whatever we do, um, especially in terms of training, can't be to the detriment of health. So sometimes um, we must also just look at the bigger picture at the end of the day, that whatever we do does not compromise health. And that is specifically going into except, um, very high stressful situations with training without adequate feel, um, feeding because that will put extra stress on the body. Yeah, absolutely, Nikki, and, and it, it works hand in hand. I mean, we, we speak about it often in, in various sort of webinars and that, that we do with regards to, uh, as you say, eating to train, uh, but getting the balance right that you are going to be tired, you are going to be putting your body under strain, and if you aren't eating correctly, that just adds to that negative, no, I say negative load, but to the stress that your body is under. And if you if you are deliberate about what you're putting into your mouth, you can you can combat a lot of, of the fatigue and, and that sort of stuff that you, you're building up as you go. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, that's definitely so. So not eating can be added stress to that training. Eating too much can be added stress to that training. So um, I think one must realize that exercise is good. It's a good stress. But it can be quickly turning into bad stress if we don't support all the systems that goes with the exercise and also remembering, <clears throat> sorry, most of us is also in other jobs or other lives and, you know, that also adds add stress. So nutrition is quite, it's one that you can easily control, you know, it's a stress that you can control and it's always about control the controllable, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Nikki, as far as, uh, I mean, we talk nutrition, we're not just talking food, obviously, we're talking what you're drinking and, and the, the sort of physiological effects of, of training, obviously there's things you need to, to worry about, uh, dehydration, GI is, uh, issues and, and, and those sorts of things. And again, is that is that something that, or, or those things, can they simply be eliminated and, and taken care of by, by yeah. making sure that you are fueling your body correctly? Yeah, they can. So what we look at is usually we try to, with nutrition, we try to delay fatigue. And um, if we talk, obviously there, there needs to be fatigue for adaptation, but um, not nutrition related. So with fatigue, the main things that's going to cause tiredness from the nutrition side would be obviously fuel shortage. So um, we're specifically talking carbohydrate fuel um, shortage. Dehydration can lead to tremendous fatigue, quite a low hanging fruit to try and fix. Um, and then there's stuff that can contribute. So if we haven't trained with enough fuel or with the right type of fuel, didn't get used to our fuel, it can lead to quite a bit of stomach issues that can lead to fatigue. And if you don't hydrate well, it can lead to an increase in body temperature that's going to cause fatigue. And if you then, you know, get to a point where you feel, well, I'm just going to drink way too much, you can actually get also that there's a basically dilution of the electrolytes and that can also lead to fatigue. So you can mess it up real badly if you don't, you know, train it beforehand. Um, to, so, yeah, I think that is the main thing to make sure that we train now what we're going to do on the day, but also understanding that through this training, you're actually supporting the effort that you put out on the bike. Absolutely. Nikki, one of the things that I love about the, the way you approach things is you, you're quite deliberate in, in, the, in, in the sense that Nothing in your sort of mind, nothing beats real food and quality food. The rest of the stuff, and we see it so often, people are taking supplements and it's this and it's that. But in your mind, you've got to lay the foundation and, and the base to be able to build the rest of the stuff on. And, and it's real solid food, uh, healthy food, that, that lays that foundation. Yeah, for sure, Brad, because you get a lot of, in food, you get a lot of stuff for free that you don't actually bargain on. So if you eat, you know, a slice of bread, there's other nutrients in it that you get for free. Um, the other thing is that it's, you know, we keep it affordable so that we can do all training sessions with our food. Sometimes I find that people that supplement a lot can supplement for the first 21 days of the month and the rest we skimp a bit. And then the other thing is it's, I mean, we live on food. It's a social thing. You don't have to distract yourself from a community because I'm busy preparing for something. You can just go by day by day intake. Um, and 
basically just knowing what is available and how to use it rather than be too restrictive in terms of what I'm allowed to eat and what I'm not allowed to eat. You know, Nikki, so let, let, let's touch out, on yeah. that, if we can, because obviously that is one of the, the sort of how much is enough. And, and someone who's training for something like the Medihub Trapnet doesn't need to be eating the same amount as somebody who's riding the Tour de France, for example. But we often see it that people are trying to lose weight, so they, they're skipping meals, they're not eating what they should be eating. T -t -t how much is enough? Yeah, I think, Brad, and thanks for that, it's, it's quite important that we do understand energy output. And I do think people underestimate um, in a sense that as we train harder, it becomes easier in a way. And then we think, ah, this is a light session. I'm going to go out for two hours on the bike. I don't need something because, you know, I'm pretty used to it. Um, if I then compare, so often I would ask people, so look at your devices and tell me what's the, you know, expenditure, how much did you spend? In the session and they tell me that it was a thousand five hundred kilojoules and so forth thinking telling me in a way that i that's actually a low intensity training but if you look at a thousand five hundred kilojoules and you compare that to food that's about nine slices of bread that you spend out there and i don't think people always realize that your body doesn't understand you know how it, it knows it's on a bike for an hour and a half so it's hard every every you know pedal stroke is hard it's not thinking, okay, this is a relaxed way. So I think people do underestimate how much um, the exercise actually costs them. That's my one, you know, issue is trying to correct that by eating more. The other one is the timing thereof. So now if we do this kind of exercise and we underestimate, then we get home like ravishing. And then we eat all that eight slices of bread extra at a supper. And then it's too late because then the training is already done. So trying to get that right, so it's for 99% of people in the field, is trying to eat more through the day so that we can control supper better. All right, fantastic. Uh, Nikki, I'm going to pause you there if that's cool. Dev, we've got a question in about training from Taryn, which I'm going to add to the screen so we can see it. Uh, Taryn's saying, hi guys, quick question. If we cross train or we triathlon train, would you equate one hour of running to two hours on the bike? Obviously, nothing beats time in the saddle to improve riding, but just interested to know what you think from a time point of view, uh, especially if you are trying to fit it all in. Yeah, so I love this question, actually. Um, firstly, I don't think... Let's not worry too much about the, the time of the run versus the time in the bike. Um, and what I mean by that is, if we're obviously training for cycling, we need to be spending time in the saddle. And as you mentioned, Taryn, nothing beats that. However... I am a big fan of cross training and running in particular works really well uh, towards your cycling. So it has a really good um, overlap, uh, helps with the strength in the legs as well. So my biggest thing is one, let's have a look firstly at the volume of your week, your weekly training um, and then work out how much time you have available. So for me, if you're going to use a run as a cross training session, I'd quite happily I'd be happy for it to be half an hour to 45 minutes, um, not necessarily needing an hour. Obviously, if you have a passion for running and you want to try and just keep a bit of running up, go for that hour and you can sort of overlap. I think the biggest thing here, though, is not just the duration of the run, but also looking where you're going to fit that run into your program that it's not going to affect your next session on the bike. So, for instance, if you're doing a quality session on the bike, an interval session on a Tuesday, for instance, and you feel, okay, you want to go for an hour run, you've got to make sure that hour run on the Wednesday is actually easy enough to not fatigue and hurt the legs and have detriment when you need to do a quality session on Thursday again. So that is something you need to just have a look and playing around where it fits in. And then if you're using it just purely as cross training to take the mind off cycling a little bit and lose the monotony of it, I would go for about half an hour to 45 minutes. Again, depending on what level you're at. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Cool. Dev, that's awesome. Uh, I'm going to just flick through these couple of slides. Um, what, I, what I'll do is I'll pop these uh, slides into uh, a link, basically, once we're done. Uh, so that you'll be able to access them all. But, uh, Nikki, let's let's touch a little bit. You, you mentioned managing the volume of how much you eat and, and eating regularly so that you don't end up going for a ride, coming back and eating anything that sits still long enough. So uh, one, of, one of the things that we see often, people are talking about intermittent fasting and 
<coughs> should they be training in a fasted state? You're a, obviously there's a place for it all, but uh, what's your what's your your sort of take on on regular meals and snacking between between training? Um, yeah, I think the the one thing that you need to consider is your goals of training. So working with your coach. There's some sessions that you do for performance and then there's some sessions that you do for adaptation. And the adaptation sessions can be maybe, um, or you can use manipulation of availability of fuel in those adaptation sessions. Um, I'm pretty much a performance goal. So I th <laughs> I'm very much that, you know, that we eat to perform and that we make sure that we eat regular. Um, basically to control hunger and to control volume. So my, uh, it is for me all about volume and controlling volume and controlling portion sizes. So <clears throat> in most of the cases, we will, if you do faster trainings, it will probably be at most twice a week and it will be training sessions that at a very, very low intensity and that's quite controlled and I think that um, shouldn't be repeated too much. Our, our main issue with the faster trainings and if it's too, too many of them, is that people get sick, and that's because of the increase in stress hormone that suppresses the immune system. So I think you need to be quite knowing what you're doing and working with your coach for certain sessions if faster training is your thing. Otherwise, I think fuel your training sessions. So to make it easy, I usually have a policy of you you know, have a meal within an hour after you wake up and try then to eat every three hours. This is now for people that's active. Um, first of all, you will want to eat because you're hungry, but then space the meals like about, as I said, three hours apart. And then make sure that one of these meals or snacks is then obviously before your training, make sure you put stuff in the training session and make sure, sure that another meal or snack then forms part of your recovery um, as such. Cool. Uh, Nikki, we're going to go more into that pre-training and, and sort of post and, and why it's necessary in just a moment. But we just got a question in from uh, Jacques. And Jacques wants to know, how much can your body consume during the ride? And how do you sustain that energy? All right. Um, Jacques, this is a brilliant question because this is what everything is based upon what I'm saying. So we do know, <clears throat> excuse me, and especially in the sport of cycling, that when you're out there, depending obviously on your on your level of cycling, but whatever we have on board in terms of especially the carbohydrate fuel is not going to be enough. We know that. So we want to obviously fuel with carbs whilst you're out there. And there's always been a big challenge of how can we get as much as possible in that the body can use. So if you think of how much your body can handle is you have to train with these amounts. So if somebody trains at a very high intensity or rise of a very high intensity. Remember, intensity is connected to carbohydrate fuel now. So the, ha the faster we go, the more carbs we use, the slower we go, it, it leans more to the fat side. So say we, we riding quite fast, um, the maximum that your body, that we suspect your body can absorb <clears throat> is about 90 grams of carbs per hour. And that is obviously not enough to literally fuel the whole race. But remember, you're not only using carbs. There's fat as well. And you've got a little bit of a tank running as well. 90 grams of carb, if I have to put it in food for you, it would be about a liter and a half of sports drink. So it's huge. It's a lot. Um, most of us don't cycle at those speeds. So we would hover between about 40 to 60 grams of carbs. So we usually ask people to eat about, you know, say two snacks of 20 grams 20 grams would be something like a gel or something like an energy bar or you know if you look at 20 grams it would be a little bit like 300 mils of your drink so what we want people to actually try to get to especially initially is to have two feedings an hour and a feeding being either a gel or a bar or a banana or then as i said 300 mils of a bottle i think if you can get that right um, you would be a far way, you know, you would be really, um, that will help you a lot in performance. And then the only way in which we're going to get it right is if you train with it. So do every long training session. Even if you think you don't need it, train it so that the gut gets used to what you're feeding on the bike. Yeah, Nikki, that, that's such an important point that you, you bring up about doing it in training. Because we see it so often people 
I don't want to say they're winged in training, but they, they don't use training as a dress rehearsal for race day. And, and often then things go wrong on race day and they're not sure why. But training is exactly that. It's an opportunity for you to test out what works and what doesn't work for you. Yeah, it's important, Brad, especially if there's people that's doing fat, you know, fat adapted rides or, as you said, faster rides, to understand that um, if you're going to make use of carbohydrate on race day, obviously to support better performance, you can't start with it on race day because your gut is not used to the carbs. Therefore, you will feel uncomfortable. So we talk about what we call a gut training. And it seems that it takes about two to three weeks for the gut to get used to the carbs. So it's it's pretty much, I mean, you've probably got another two weeks to go fasted and fat adapted and all those kind of things. But then you need to start training with the carbs that you're going to use in the race so that your gut gets used to it so that you feel comfortable on the day. Nikki, let's talk about prior, like before training. Obviously, a lot of people cycle early mornings and it's not always easy to get fueled up before a, a training ride. Talk to us a little bit about sort of the, what the goals are and, and what, what a, a good sort of recipe is for, for pre-race or pre-training fueling. Okay, so the goals are to fill up a little bit of a tank, especially if it's going to be a long ride. The other one is not to get hungry on the bike, that you have to turn around and go home for breakfast. And the other one is that you have to feel comfortable. So the main thing, remember, always our fuel food is a carbohydrate-based, our recovery food is protein-based. So the main emphasis on eating before you go onto the bike would be a carbohydrate predominant meal. I don't mind adding protein to the meal, but it would be rather two toast and one egg than what you eat, you know, two eggs and one toast. Um, also, when you do this meal, think of what you're going to do in competition. So if your normal meal before you go out in terms of a race is oats, try to do it with oats. I mean, <clears throat> even if it's two or three or four spoons so that the body can just get used to it. So it's a carb predominant thing. A little bit of protein if you like. Protein, I would, as I said, eggs, or you can add a little bit of milk to the oats. That's protein. So all that the protein is going to do is going to sustain you a little bit so the, the sugar is going to be released slower but for a longer period of time. But further than that, it's not it's not helping you. Um, and the other thing that we want to limit in this meal is fat. So having bacon and peanut butters and, you know, butter and fried stuff. The reason for this is it stays in your stomach for a long time. So you do feel uncomfortable and it doesn't clear from the stomach. I think most of those foods, luckily... We don't have time to do in the morning, but I know there's some people that would put butter and coffee and those kind of things, which is really not an ideal type of meal to go into. And the other thing that we have to be very aware of, of um, going into a training session is liquid intake. So make very sure that you take liquid before you get onto the bike because the hydration can really influence your training performance as such. Um, if you scrappy with it, then obviously you can try and catch up whilst you're on the bike. Um, but otherwise, I would definitely ask you, so it's carbs with a bit of protein with a lot of, of or with fluid intake, little bit of, um, as little as possible fat, and then also make sure that the fiber component is controlled. So if you're used to fiber, eat fiber. If you're not used to fiber, rather stay clear of that. So it's a good bowl of oats with a bit of milk and honey in it or banana sliced into it. And um, if you've one of those that's really early in the morning on the bike and you really don't have time to eat, just drink a big glass of juice, like a berry juice or orange juice before you get on there. That already will give you the carbs to sustain a better performance. And, and Nikki, you, you touched on the, the hydration prior to training as well. And it's, it's important to sort of take note of, of what's happening with your body. And a, a great indication is, is obviously the color of your urine. And, and that's something you can keep an eye on to, to see that you are staying hydrated throughout a, a training block. Yeah, that is important. Um, so the color and the volume of urine and um, also keeping in mind that most of us is a little bit dehydrated when we wake up in the morning, um, depending obviously on, on one, when you went to bed and what was your fluid intake. So the main thing we look at there is that you take, before you go on to training, and I, I, sometimes this is difficult because it's early morning training. So it's, if it's very early morning, I think just make sure that you drink about a cup to two cups of liquid. In your breakfast it can be coffee it can be tea it can be water so anything except for alcohol if you have more time you drink that you know 500 ml so two cups you wait a bit and see and then check the urine color again and even check if there is bladder emptying so if you drink 500 ml of liquid within two hours you didn't go to the bathroom 
then you probably need another little bit of liquid before you go onto the bike. Um, and that would be another cup of something. Um, and as I said, make, to make it easier, just remember something like your mug of coffee is liquid. You don't have to drink, you know, half a liter of water or force it down before you go onto the bike. If that is not good, um, so you've got a very, you know, very concentrated urine, very dark color, just make sure that you take on the bike maybe an extra bottle. Because I often see people going onto the bike with just a single bottle. doesn't matter if they go for an hour, two hours, or three hours. Um, they will just have the single bottle with them and don't necessarily refill it, you know, when they're busy with training. Speaking of, of coffee, Nikki, Eric's got a, a great question. He says, cyclists love coffee. He says, will or can coffee before your ride affect your training or racing? Yeah, it can. Um, the caffeine does affect it for the better. So it's actually a good thing. Um, so caffeine is one of what we call ergogenic aid. So that it can um, improve in performance and it does decrease the perception of fatigue. So we don't get tired that easy or we don't think we're tired. Um, so therefore I'm all for, I mean, the use of coffee. There was a big myth that it dehydrates us. It shouldn't dehydrate because the amount of liquid it is a bit of a diuretic, but if you take like a mug of coffee, the amount of liquid that you take in is enough to counter the diuretic, diuretic effect. It's just when we drink espressos, then it's important that you, when you drink espresso, to do drink the, the glass of water afterwards to have the fluid intake. Um, but you can definitely carry on with your coffee. There's no problem with that. Now, the problem comes with the banana bread on coffee rides, Nikki, uh, at every second stop on a, on a long ride. <coughs> Yeah, we need to decide which, you know, as Devlin said, what is the quality ride <laughs> <laughs> and what is the one that we just need to relax around and so that you can tell the people at home you're out, you know, you're out for a ride, but it's not necessarily a training, eh? I have to tell you, Dev, Dev you're going to laugh at this, and I'm not going to mention any names for fear of retribution, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to point any fingers, but I, I went on a ride a month or so ago with a whole bunch of guys down here in Cape Town. Uh, who are very well known in cycling circles and it was about a 70k ride and we stopped twice for breakfast at two separate spots <laughs> so it was, it was a, a definite definite coffee rides uh, of, of epic proportions <laughs> look Brad I'm fine with that if it's a, if it's an intensity ride for that duration <laughs> then you got to feel as Nikki says <laughs> um, can I just if if I could just jump in quickly yeah. just as a as a practical tip, so when we're talking pre-training and more so on race day, actually, and Nikki, you can sort of jump in here as well, mm -hmm. but something I like to do, if especially on race day, if you're planning on getting to the, the venue early, finding parking, setting your bike up, getting things sorted out, most of the time you've got up in the morning, you might have a little bit of nerves, you've had your breakfast. But now you're actually having that breakfast a little bit early and you're sitting outside that one to two hour window before you actually start the ride. So a tip that I like to do is I'll have my breakfast a little bit early and I'll generally mix a spare bottle with me of whatever I'm going to be drinking on the ride. So my carbohydrate drink. And in the hour, once I've parked at the venue and setting the bike up, getting kitted and all that, I'm constantly sipping on that bottle of drink. So one helping with with high, keeping myself hydrated but at the same time still taking in a carbohydrate source that has me ready to go so kind of killing two birds with one stone yeah that's good eh yeah Dev that, that's such a great point you make as well because particularly I mean often we, we don't ride our long rides all the time from home we might ride for instance hop in the car head to the cradle or or, or head out to to Kroonkloof in, in Pretoria as an example so it's not like you're going to be sitting around long before you get on the bike. So you're not used to doing that. And, and on race day particularly, there might be a bit of a longer window. So I think that is that is great advice for, for race day prior prior to the race as well. Nikki, I, you mentioned the, the sort of how much to do and uh, how much you should be consuming on the bike during training and, and racing. Jack asked the question as well. And, and there were slides that we had. I didn't want to flick through to them because it was a – uh, sort of, I don't want to skip too far ahead and have to go back, but we've got those slides up on the screen now where we can talk about sort of what you should be doing because I think people aren't, aren't quite sure they can't quantify how much they should be taking in. 
Can, can you mm -hmm. run through those sort of numbers again where you were saying about the, the amount of grape per carbs per, per hour and that sort of thing that should be taken? <clears throat> All right. So we're working, and I think I'm going to just do it in two ways. So i first kind of give the gramage. So those of you that's got pr products with labels, please use the following gramage. So if you currently not taking a lot of carbs, try your first goal to between 30 and 40 grams per car um, ca carbs per hour. So we take two snacks containing 20 grams. So that is if you can read your stuff on the label. If you're not doing labelized stuff, that means a, a, something like a banana is 20. So I'm going to just tell you what contains 20 grams so you know it's two of those snacks. So banana is 20 grams, gel is 20 grams. If you're eating a, a big bar, like a normal energy bar, that's usually 20 grams. If it's the smaller bars, those are 15, usually 15 grams. And if you look at bottles, to get to 20 grams, you're probably going to have to drink about 300 mils. So that the, the main thing is to start off with having two snacks. So eat every half an hour, either drink the bottle or eat one of those snacks. Um, if you're not closely there, start with one an hour and move from there. If you eat the carbohydrate stuff, you don't have to have juice bottles. Then you can have water in the bottle. But remember, electrolyte mixtures doesn't all have carbs in it. Some is just salt and water. Um, once you get to one, try to increase it to two. And once you get to two, try to increase it to three. I think that's when most people will stop. So having something every 20 minutes. Those of us that, you know, the extremely fast guys, they will try to push the about every feeding every 15 minutes to get much, you know, much more of the, of the jet fuel into their, into their system. So I hope that makes sense. And then the other important thing on the bike is obviously hydration, to make sure that if you only eat, you know, most of your carbs, you have to take water as well. So like when you drink a gel, make sure that there's water with it. Um, and if you then have carb drinks, then that would be part of the carbs. But make sure that we hydrate well as well whilst we're on the bike. Cool stuff. Nikki, you, you spoke about carbs. And over the years, people have been in favor of carbohydrates. And then there have been people who have vilified carbohydrates. Let's talk a little bit about carbs. Are they important, first of all? And if so, why? Yeah, they're important um, because, as I said, they just jet fuel. So if you look at different fuel sources, you get those that gives me um, fuel in high intensity situations, that's the carbs. So more like a jet fuel or petrol setup, where fat is more like a diesel fuel. So on extreme long stuff, but at a low intensity, the diesel fuel is also obviously important. The problem, although, is diesel fuel or the fat comes in storage on the bodies for, so you've got it on you, even if you didn't ask for it. And that can take you for a long, long time. Where with the jet fuel or the carbohydrate fuel, we only have a very small tank. So we run out of carbs. And that is usually where you feel that there's bonking and that is usually where you have to then decrease the speed. So that is why the carbohydrate will definitely be important <clears throat> for performance, is especially intensity performance. If you don't really worry about anything and you just ride there at the back, probably it's not that important. The other thing that is important with carbs is because we've got such small tanks, then our blood sugar also seems to drop a little bit. And if you run out of carbs, that blood sugar can't be controlled. So then you have sometimes what we call symptoms of central fatigue. But that is where, you know, stuff becomes blurry. You can't really focus. Um, you extremely tired as if you want to go to sleep, actually yawning whilst you're riding, those kind of things. That's a low blood sugar, and that is actually quite dangerous. To ride with a low blood sugar because you're not coherent then anymore so the main thing is just remember the tank is small and therefore if we can provide extra on the bike usually the performance will go better you, you talk about that small tank there's off also over the years there's been lots of talk particularly in, in sort of running circles about carbo loading is is that a thing is that something we should be worrying about yeah it is a thing um so it works well for some for others it doesn't um, it became quite unpopular because of people's um, fear of carbs that grew. Um, but carb loading can actually, so it basically just means that we fill up a tank to the brim. Um, like most of us, um, you know, will fill up before the petrol price goes up. So it's basically so that when I start this race that I have a full, full, full tank. So it, it's much better than 
whilst you're on the road um, in terms of not trying to force things down all the time. So this is usually quite, it works quite well if you go for activities longer than 90 minutes or longer than an hour and a half, which is definitely cycling would be one. The negative of this, although, is that if you have a full tank, the car is heavier now. So you are heavier on the bike, um, and that extra weight can cause a little bit of havoc, especially if the, if the profile of the race is climbing in the first, you know, 50 k's. But for most people, it seems really still to work quite a bit, and it's got solid evidence to work. Also, just the thing that I think you should try beforehand, don't try it for the first time on the race day. Uh, don't forget, if you have got any questions, please pop them in the comments below. If you have just joined us, welcome. We are talking uh, nutrition strategies in the build-up to the 2019 Midi Health Prop Net. Uh, another question in from Eric. Uh, Nikki, Eric says, uh, what's the deal with date balls? How easily does the body break uh, down those kind of snacks? Yeah, um, that's quite good snacks, eh? So date, the, the advantage of these date balls is actually it sits in the date. So I think you can just eat the date as well. But it's quite a um, very um, high concentration of sugar. So the nice thing about this is you can take a small bite and it goes far, you know, quite a far away if you compare it with a jelly baby or something like that. Um, again, that's quite high in fiber as well. So it's also something that you need to really train with before you just do it on race day. But they're nice and small and compact. They taste most of the time or most of them taste well. Um, so really try and train with them as well. So if you if you look at dates per se, I mean, um, two dates is about equal the amount of carbohydrate that you would find in one small banana. So obviously much more compact than to ride with a bunch of bananas and um, quite easily, to, um, you know, to get down. So just remember to take fluid with them. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Nikki... We've spoken pretty much what to do before training, what to do during training and racing, but Devlin was talking about recovery, and we spoke about it in the last webinar we did as well. Uh, Post-training, uh, nutrition is vital as well if you are going to get the best out of your body. Yeah, it's, it's crucial, um, and it's also crucial for the immune system, so it's really, really important. Um, when nutrition is one of the very strong pillars, it's not, you know, recovery is not all in food, there's obviously quite a few um, contributing components. But if you look at food, it's, it's really a strong pillar. And it's basically three things. And in this, um, basically, order of importance. The first thing is to try and get something that contains carbohydrate as soon as possible after your ride. So this can be a sugary thing. It can be your oats. It can be toast. It can be um, cereal with milk, anything like that. And that is basically to refill the glycogen store. So that is to refuel the tank. If we do it within, say, 30 minutes after your ride, you've got a nice, fast, you know, recovery from there. Point number two and second of importance is hydration. So make sure whatever you take then does contain liquid. So if, say, for instance, I'm going to have my carbs through a bowl of oats, I need to take water or coffee or tea or juice with that. And the third one would be protein. Remember, I said something about protein being our recovery one. But it's important um, to please remember that a recovery is not a protein shake. A recovery is a protein shake maybe mixed with milk with a banana. So it must have the carb protein mix and it must have the liquid. So we usually talk about refueling, rehydration, and repairing. Those three is, is really the, the most crucial to get in and as far as possible within 30 minutes. And I think most people have heard about the whole thing about Steri Stumpies or flavored milk, chocolate flavored milk. They're brilliant as a recovery aid. So quite easy also to get in. doesn't matter how hard you've raced or how hard you trained. So, um, and it's basically just because this, this chocolate flavored milk combine all the aspects in one drink. So it's easy to get down. And the timing of that's quite important, Nikki. You, you want to try and get that in as soon after your, your ride as possible. Yeah, as soon as what is comfortable. Um, it is although also important that after this recovery is started, so we want it, if you can get your way within 30 minutes after that training, it would be awesome. So it, it's going to have to be a planned thing. It doesn't, it's just not going to appear in your car on your way home. So um, within 30 minutes, and then also if you, you know, sometimes if it was interval sets and you're really, really tired and it was hard, 
and you're a little bit nauseous, it's sometimes difficult to get it in. But if you can le at least get some of it in and then just follow up within two hours with another feeding, that will really help recovery. I, I, I just cannot emphasize how important this is and how much of a difference it makes to what your body feels like tomorrow. So please, just within half an hour, I think up until an hour window, you're still okay. But try to get it in there as soon as comfortable. Absolutely. And then just finally to wrap things up from you, Nikki, a couple of, a couple of tips. You've, you've got a few good ones that uh, I've, I've put up on screen now. And we talk about it every single time when, whenever we talk about any race. I think big rule number one is nothing new on race day. That's it. So therefore, if we want nothing new on race day, you just need to start training with what you're going to use on race day now. Um, mix and match options. So something, you know, try to have two or, diff two or three different things. Um, if you eat the one thing over and over and over again, it can really get monotonous after five hours on the bike. Um, use the same products that you're using now on that day. So if there's any sponsored things that you want to try out beforehand, try it out now. Um, maybe there's guarana in it or caffeine or something that doesn't agree with you. So try it out before you're going to use it. Um, don't be afraid to listen to your gut. So if you feel that it's just getting too much, you know, those two feedings that I spoke about is just too much, skip one. It's okay. Um, if you start early with eating and drinking, usually later on you can skip one or two because you still got a little bit of your tank. Remember, because you're using the external sources in the beginning. Um if the gut is resisting a bit, so um, you can leave one or two. Or the other thing is then to try and do your feeding when there's no intensity. So don't try to do most of your feeding while while you're busy, you know, riding uphill. Wait for a nice flat flat part where the intensity is not that high. Um, make sure you're not dehydrated when you start the race, and plan your breakfast on the race day well well in advance, and make sure that it is available. Don't um, eat something that is not available and as uh, I think Dave had a good idea there because you're eating your breakfast at home take another snack with you um, because there will be time to fill up it doesn't have to be a liquid it can be an energy bar or banana or something like that absolutely and don't forget if you'd like to get a hold of Nikki I've popped her details up on screen as well uh, like I said at the start Nikki is in private practice as well uh, out in Victoria so if you do need any personal help with your, your nutrition you can get a hold of uh, Nikki through her practice on, the, on that email uh, and uh, yeah we'll, we'll take it from there if you've got any questions feel free to pop them into the comments below Nikki that was awesome thank you thank you so much every time I do one of these things I learn something new from you so uh, that's awesome and uh, yeah I hope uh, everyone got got lots out of that as well there was uh, a ton to take in and like I said we'll make the slides available uh, as soon as we're done I'll pop them into a link into the comments as well and we'll send them out by email too so you can go through all of the slides and you'll get all the the details with regards to how many grams per hour and that sort of thing so you don't have to take furious notes tonight uh dev uh, i'll bring you back in in just a second uh, and i'm going to open the floor again if there are any questions we are running uh low on time we've only got about five minutes left so if you've got any questions get them in now but if uh just want to run through some resources if you haven't checked out the latest edition of modern athlete uh there's a great article in there from devlin uh, about getting your ride on some uh, some great tips in there uh, and uh, maybe how Trump had mentioned in that article as well so definitely check that article out I made a, a pretty easy link for you to to go to that all you have to do is go to coachperry.com forward slash article uh, and it'll redirect you to the digimag you can go and read that uh, after we're done here this evening as well be sure to check out the ride with coach perry podcast wherever you listen to your podcast there's also a whole bunch of uh, videos just search for coach perry on youtube uh, and then also be sure to check out the official MediHub TropNet training plans. If you are winging it uh, in the build-up to this year's race and you need some help for the last few weeks, be sure to head over and check out those uh, official MediHub TropNet uh, training programs that are available right now on coachparry.com. Uh, there's a training plan to suit your ability to tell you exactly what you need to do every single day uh, at the right intensity. So you know exactly what you need to do when you head out on your bike. And you also get access to Devlin on a daily basis, uh, who is able to guide you in the forums. And it's all available through our easy-to-access uh, iOS and Android app as well. And uh, we're giving you a great deal as uh, someone who's riding the, the MediHub Trupnet. 30% off. All you need to do is head over to coachparry.com forward slash Trupnet to get all those details. And then before we wrap things up, 
we mentioned it in the last webinar, Dev Devlin and I are still green with envy that we can't enter, and I'm sure Nikki's going to be after uh, I tell everybody about this. But if you haven't entered the race yet, you need to do so, okay, and do it in a hurry because Up for Grabs is a VIP cycling trip to ride the Pinarello Grand Fondo. It's going to be amazing. It's taking place in Italy for uh, three nights, four-star accommodation as opposed to uh, four nights of three star, I'll take the three four stars, thank you. Uh, there's return flights, uh, transfers, and a whole bunch more as well. You can get all those details, uh, see what's there, two sets of cycling kit and other gifts, race day technical support, uh, and the winner of the prize will join the AST travel group uh, that is heading uh, to Italy. It's an amazing prize and it could be yours. And all you need to do to stand in line to win is make sure you enter the MediHelp truck net by the 23rd, uh, sorry, by the 23rd, by 11.59 on the 16th of September. That's how you get into the draw. The website to get to uh, is obviously trucknet.co.za. So that's where you can enter. The next webinar is happening on Wednesday, the 18th of September, uh, and this is where you can register. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. If there are any final questions, uh, speak now, forever hold your peace. Elmarie saying thanks, I'm a beginner and I found this very helpful and informative. Elmarie, thank you for joining us. Much appreciated. Jacques saying thanks, it was great. Uh, we'll be in contact with Nikki. Jacques, perfect. If you uh, need those details, you can watch the replay or just get in touch with us via email. Uh, Paul also saying thanks, all good. So, uh, yeah, if there are any or if there aren't any other questions, I think we can... Uh, call this in quits. Dev, final final words from you with regards to training, and then we'll touch base again in two weeks' time where we're going to be talking about the sort of final run in the taper, which is my favorite part of training for a race, and then uh, we'll be touching on race day strategies and uh, how to achieve the goal that you worked so hard to achieve. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us tonight, Dev. Your final, final, final say. Yeah, um, look, uh, I think there was quite a lot to take in, so don't be overwhelmed by it. We are here to assist. Um, stay consistent in your training again there's that word and then the biggest thing I think now especially and we mentioned a little bit earlier is just trying to stay healthy so it is definitely something where we're picking up a lot of people getting sick at this time especially with changes of season so it's vital now to do what you need to do to stay healthy uh, and avoid people if you need to so <laughs> yeah enjoy the training and we'll chat soon did you just say ship your kids out of the house for the next four weeks Nick? no comment <laughs> Nikki, thank you very much to you as well. Final final word from you. Um, thanks for all your time. I think the final word here is just remember to feel training sessions. Eh? Um, and especially maybe just set a goal to recover every single session. It will take you far away into your training. Absolutely. And thank you all for spending an hour with us. We know how busy life is and how hectic things are. We really do appreciate your time and we look forward to catching up with you again in two weeks' time.